This is the Connected Baby podcast series, sponsored by you, the listener. If you'd like to help spread the message of the science of connection even further, then you can make a donation at connectedbaby.net forward slash donate. Welcome to the Connected Baby podcast, where we explore how people are putting the science of connection to use in their lives. Hello and welcome to our weekly Connected Baby podcast with Dr. Susan Ziedike. I'm Gary Robinson. Today, our special guest is the Director of Children and Family Services and External Affairs for Children First. It's Mary Glasgow. Mary was also a, uh, uh, she was with Bernardo's previously, I understand. Uh, and before that, a social worker. Does that sum up your CV, Mary? I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. But those are the headlines. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. Great to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It's Uh, wonderful to have you, honey. It is good. Um, So as we mentioned, you're currently Director of Children and Family Services and External Affairs with Children First. Uh, It sounds like a very big job, but if we could bring it down and and sort of bring it down, pot it a little bit, um, what what does it entail? I know that's a very sort of small question for a very big job, but what does it entail? So in its simplest form, all it means is that I work with our staff to make sure that the services, the support services that we deliver on behalf of Children First to children and families up and down the country um, are the right services that are of good quality and that they make a, a real difference to children's lives. And the other bit of the job title, which is the external affairs bit, just means that I use the um, information that comes back to us, both from our staff and also from the children and young people and families that we support, to try and influence and change government um, policy and legislation and attitudes and behaviours so that we um, sort of drive forward that goal to transform children's lives and make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up, really. And and if we and actually you've just touched on it towards the end of that sentence there. But just for anybody who's unaware of Children First, um, what, what is the what are, what are the aims and the rationale of the organisation? So the main aims. I mean, traditionally, Children First it was known as the Royal Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, which is a rather long and pretty old-fashioned title, um, and was renamed Children First. So it comes it comes out actually of a, a real community development approach where there were local groups of people who wanted to improve the lives of children who were uh, being abused or neglected or not able to be cared for properly. That's its history. Um, and from those roots, we've developed over the last 130 years into a vibrant national children's charity that still works to do that, but takes a much more strength-based approach. So we get involved in communities, we get alongside families, we get alongside governments and try and see what support is required and what is the context that's needed to make sure that children grown up in Scotland have the best opportunities that they can. So just to clarify, probably for, 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 my, uh, for, for my brain more than anything else, uh, when you say a national charity, national in terms of Scotland or in terms of the UK? Just Scotland. In national terms of Scotland. Terms of Scotland. In terms of Scotland. So the whole country we have services up and down. And if I pick up on something that Mary just said, she said, get in alongside the children, alongside families. That's a relationship-based approach when you're alongside somebody. That's not simply delivering a service. That's getting in with them. That's a relationship. And it's one of the things I love about Children First is that they are really seeking to build relationships and in terms of your history, Mary, you're obviously clearly passionate about working with children. How did you become interested in that? Um, I, I, you're right about um, passion, and I've worked for a number of organisations in a number of settings over the years. It's hard to know, isn't it, how you get <laughs> how that's your thing. I think it's my thing, you know, like a lot of us, because I was one once, I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had the great fortune of growing up in a family where I was loved and nurtured and respected and valued. Um, But I lived in a community alongside families where that wasn't the case. So my parents were very involved in community work. I um, lived in a so-called disadvantaged community where I saw children that didn't quite have the same family support that I had. And I suppose from that, I developed this real sense of... I suppose that it's just about luck, isn't it? It's kind of your luck... What are your parents like? Where are you born? What opportunities do you get? And when I reflect back, I think what really drove me into this as a career was that bit about 
Suzanne's just mentioned, the, the power of relationships that change lives. So I can think about teachers, I can think about community workers, I can think about relatives, I can think about colleagues um, that helped shape my passion or gave me a message which was that somehow you can make a contribution. And, I, and the other, the main bit is just the wonder of children, isn't it? It sounds a bit trite, a bit easy, a bit easy to see, but just genuinely, I look at the children that we support um, in our services, or you know, that I've come across in my own career, and I never fail to be amazed at what they endure, recover from, contribute, um, and I can honestly say the best, the, the best lessons and the, the most wise words that I've ever heard have probably come out the mouths of children either that I've directly worked with or that I've known in my life. So yeah. um, I, I think that's where I think that's where it comes from. I think it's just about um, you know, no, just believing really, truly how important it is to make sure that we value children. And with the work that you do now with Children First, how does, how does that bring you into contact with Connection? How is Connection used within your organisation? So in our organisation, I mean, Suzanne talked about the word relationship, and, and I, I constantly describe what we do as relational. We're a relation-based organisation. We're about humans. We're about people connecting. We're about changing things. Um, and so for us, what I've What's really helped me um, is the science behind connection and working alongside Suzanne, listening to her, learning from some of the science that she's helped distill to be much more understandable, is that in the face of, at times, um, a drive to see what is the programme or what is the thing that's going to change people's lives, it's helped, it's helped us in our organisation hold on to that central theme or principle which is actually it's not really the program that changes a life it's the relationship within which that that thing is delivered so it's given us confidence it gives me knowledge it helps me um describe a complex thing in a simple way that says do you know what folks it's just it's the same for all of us when we're in good relationships that are respectful and energized and positive we can achieve great things so it's just helped me to hold on to the the, the main evidence if you like that the most important evidence is the the one that's about relationships how do we how are we with each other how do we respect each other what do we expect each other to offer um, so it's just really helped us to maintain a, a principle and a value base, I think, in our organisation. Two-part question, really. First for you, Suzanne, um, how how recent is Connection? I mean, has it been around for hundreds of years that, as we know it now, or did we, you know, or is it a relatively is it a relatively new concept well, in terms of science? Let me ter- in terms of the science this is a really important thing. Okay, Connection has been around as long as there were human beings and indeed as long as there were mammals because our need for connection is mammalian. It, it, it's part of what it means to be a breathing creature that nurtures its young. For humans, it's particularly important because we come into the world with incomplete brains and we're really dependent on other people to save us if a saber-toothed tiger comes into our village and tries to eat us because we can't walk for at least a year and run for three. So connection is what it means to be human. The science of connection is more recent than that. We used to think that babies couldn't see, that babies didn't feel pain, that babies forgot their early years. We now know that those early relationships get wired into your brain. And that changes everything to, to realize that you come into the world with a brain already connected and that connection is going to affect your brain. But a lot of people don't know that, which is the whole point of Connected Baby, to help people to know that and to think about where that matters for services. So if I expand just a teensy bit more, Mary's talking about a organization that tries to form relationships. That's revolutionary in some sense because in our world now we try and administer services we deliver services we don't think in terms of relationships we think in terms of programs so mary's trying to do something that i think is revolutionary she's trying to get us to work in a more human way which is not what all services want to do mary have i spoken too strongly no absolutely not i mean one of the things that 
we've done together and I, we've watched and I continually um, encourage our staff to do is say, like, bring your whole self to work. Bring the relational part of you to work. You're not a helper or a worker or a staff member. You know, you do have to have boundaries around that relationship. It has to have clear goals. But it, it will flourish the best within a truly genuine and authentic connection or relationship with the, the family member or the person, the child, even the community that you're getting alongside. But it respects the stories of the people that we work with. It respects the communities that we work in. It doesn't, as Suzanne says, arrive one day and parachute in some ready-made solution that we've developed in another room. What we're really interested in doing is that approach which says, right, so what's, what's good about this? What's the challenges and what bits can we work on together and how will we know when, when it's got better because we'll continually check in with each other in a relational way. This, the, 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 let's yes, think sir. about, Mary just said, we encourage people to bring their f- whole self to work. That is not the dialogue that we hear for lots of jobs. Mm-hmm. What, what we're more used to hearing is leave your personal part of yourself at home and bring only your work self to work. And Mary is and Children First are turning that on its head. That's really different. And yet it's what the science tells us is most effective. I suppose the second part of my question about how long has connection and the science of connection been around uh, is t- is to you, Mary, about when when did Children First acknowledge the science of connection or has it always been there in some form or another as part of your organisation? Did you have a, eure- been- a eureka moment? I think it's always been there um, in individuals. I think it's always been, as I observe what happens, and, you know, I don't think, I use the term magic, but actually I don't, I don't think that's too strong a word. Sometimes what I observe between um, staff members, workers and family members and children looks like magic and it, because it's so simple when it's, <laughs> when it's really flowing well and people are very connected and engaged. And I think that that's a tradition that's grown up in the organisation over many, many years. So I don't think there's been a single eureka moment. I think we've always done it. I think in the last few years, particularly through the work that that Suzanne does and the way that she describes it and the way that she helps us think about it and the courageous questions that she asks us, I think what's allowed us to do is get courage and confidence to see what we do is scientific. We thought it was just that we were thoughtful, reflective, effective practitioners. And now what we know is that we're warm, human, interested, curious and caring individuals. And it's all right to use those words. So sometimes our staff might say, I'm not really sure what I did to do that. And then I might go and say to a parent or a child, tell me what it was that really made the difference. And they never, ever tell me that it was about the programme or the group or the thing. It's always about the person. They say, do you know what? Somebody came into my life at a time that I needed support and they really listened. They really listened carefully to the story. They respected my perspective on it. And then they gave me this high support, high challenge environment with which to work and they were right alongside me, holding my hand, doing some really tough work. So, so you're talking about working in a, in a relational way uh, as opposed to a programme-led way. Do you find yourself as an organisation butting heads with other organisations, or dare, dare I say government, uh, that, that wants you to work in, a, in a, an a evidence-based programme sort of way? Do you, do you find yourself at conflict sometimes? At times I would describe it as having felt frustrated or... Um... You know, but I, I don't think we go. I think if you work in a relation, a relational way, what you do is try not to go head to head. So, what I try and do, and I think you know, I've got, I, I get, I have to work on this all the time. I don't. I think we all do, is try and find ways to ask questions and get people to think. Um, and I, you know, Suzanne will say this. How do you think more deeply about? what really makes a difference. So there is no doubt that we have had a tricky journey over the last few years to see, okay, there is a drive for evidence and there is a drive to find a a simple universal programme that will meet everybody's needs and improve the lives of children. And what we've had to do is have some courage and some confidence to say, 
okay, that's fine, that's interesting, let's think about it. But to really push that line which says, but we know over all the years, and I know this, and so do most of my colleagues know this, in all the jobs that I've done, in all the organisations that I've done, that the best changes have taken place in a relationship between two people. And so what we've tried to do is use our influence and the voices and experience of the families that we support to get that message across clearly, but in a way that's thoughtful, hopefully, and mature. So, yes, it is challenging. Um, and it sort of mirrors the work that we do with families as well, the work that we do with colleagues and other agencies and partners and in um, government. So sometimes it's sometimes it's a little difficult. Sometimes you need to say things that are hard to hear. And sometimes other people need to say things that are hard to hear and we need to listen to. And somehow you muddle through. But I suppose what we've done is just grown in confidence and saying, actually, we think the science and the evidence that suggests that real, that that support that's delivered within the context of strong relationships is the most effective. There's lots of evidence around attachment, relationships, connection, and that's what we're really going to pin our work around. That's the theory that we're going to base our service offer around. What what I think Children First is doing, and what the science of connection gives us, is that it affirms that life is messy. Mm -hmm. Life is often not clear. Relationships are not clear. How a life can solve the challenges that are currently going on is not clear. And it's kind of interesting that as a society and at our time in history, we've gotten impatient and we've gotten scared. We want quick fix solutions. And we hope that evidence-based programs, which have been tried out on other people and shown to make a difference, if we parachute that program in, it will fix all these problems. And hopefully it will do that in eight weeks. And what Children's First is saying is it's not that straightforward. It's not one size fits all. It's not one size fits all. And in fact, I would take it a step further. We think of those programs as changing the people that we are delivering services to. I don't think of them that way. Programs change us, the staff. Programs help us to listen better. And they give us ways to talk about things differently. They change us. And it's us that changes that helps to change those people. It's not the program, it's relationships. And Children First gets that and says it proudly, which is why I'm so delighted to work with them. And working in that relational way, Mary, um, how do you know it's effective? I think I think what I'm asking is, is there, is there a story, uh, something you can share with us about it, maybe a particular child or a family where this has been particularly effective? And you go, yeah, do you know what? This is a great example to share. So, I mean, it's it's hard for me to have a specific example that I, that's recent within my time at Children First. I mean, I my whole um, career, I guess, from being a social worker myself to a manager in social work and then moving into the voluntary sector, that's that's the story that I see them as being most effective. Whether it's been an individual. Um, relationship with a child where they've been at risk or there've been concerns about their, their well being or whether it's been within a family to improve relationships or it's whether it's been in a community to develop a service. It's always been my understanding and my experience and my learning that those things work much better when you get, and and it is that word, get right alongside people and say, what's going on here? What's happening? What's happening that works okay and that is good enough and what needs to improve? Um, So I could, you know, I I wouldn't want to pick up a, a specific example, but I do see and hear through some of the way that we collect our information and our data, if you like, our stories, our narratives about the work that we do, that that's a really effective model. So we deliver a lot of family support services to kinship carers, for example, and, and Suzanne has helped us work with kinship carers. And what we've been able to do there is often these are families who take on the, the um, bringing up of really you know, vulnerable children who've had lots of experience of trauma and loss and challenge in their lives. And these, their extended families, often grandparents or aunts or uncles, will take them, um, reclaim them, if you like, into their own family as an alternative to the state, to the, to the children having to go, in, go into care. 
And what we try and do with them is try to manage that through a relational way by saying, do you know what, you've done an amazing thing. You've just reclaimed your own family member and you're going to help them repair and recover so they go on and live fulfilling lives. And the, 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 the work that we do alongside that is to say, so what's our part in this? Because you're doing the most important bit. You've reclaimed this kid. You're offering love, you're offering shelter, you're offering security. And what can we do to make that easier? So the bits that we do are offer emotional support to that carer. So remind them what an important job it is and offer practical support. So what do you need to get in by way of a break occasionally mm-hmm. or advice to make it less of a financial concern or burden for you? you what is it that we can do to make this experience for you and this child that you've reclaimed that you've chosen to love and look after what's the job that we can do to make that easier and that's you know and that's just one example of the way that we might look at an issue or an, an area that we've been asked to offer support in and, and and tackle it in a relational way and if i what we won't say is do you know what we've got a program over here on our <laughs> shelf and you can come along to a group and access that and then things will be better. We may offer that, that may work, it may help, but it won't be the key thing that will help that family stay together, work together, work through some of the the real challenges that they'll face. And if I pick up on that example, it's a way of thinking is really what you're saying, Mary. So uh, if there is a program, the program helps us to think about how to meet the relationship needs of the people we're serving. It's not that the program will fix it. It's that it's another tool to help the relationship. Exactly. And if we take the kinship care example that you've just given, I remember that conference that we did, Mary, with kinship carers, and it was fabulous because we pointed out that kinship carers have a difficult time. They often don't get any money from the state or very or a smaller amount of money, foster carers get more money than kinship carers do. And that's often difficult for kinship carers, and they're not always happy about that. And yet, kinship carers can administer cuddles. Kinship carers can hug children. And many foster carers are told that they're not allowed to do that. Relational thinking helps us to wonder, what's it like if you're a kid growing up in state care and you don't get cuddles? Kinship carers have oodles of cuddles for their children. And so Children First is able to take more seriously their ability to help children get cuddles. That's a great example of relational thinking. Just building on that, actually, because it's interesting today that we're having this conversation about kinship carers because... Um, the government have just announced, actually, that they will give access to eligible kinship carers some, finan- some greater financial support. And part of that, we, you know, we hope that we've played a small part in that by our National Kinship Care Service, where we have kinship carers who we offer advice and support to have continually raised that as an issue. That one, you know, it, it, it's fine. You know, every, people want to care for their relatives. But if you're financially disadvantaged, that can make it a barrier. And so we've used that feedback and really worked with the government and hopefully influenced their thinking. And so today we're, we're having this conversation on a day when the government have just announced that they will, um, you know, they've announced a £10 million increase in the amount of support, financial support available to kinship carers. And on top of that, we know that, that you know, what, we, what they also need is more emotional support, more more practical support to make them able to to keep and claim these children within their own families where they belong. And so that's what relational thinking gives us. The money isn't going to fix it. It isn't the money that does it. What the money does is help kinship carers to build stronger relationships with their children because it takes away some of the stress. It's not the money, it's the relationships. Exactly. And Mary, with Children First and, and with your time at Bernardo's, I believe you've been working alongside Connected Baby and Suzanne. Um, how have how have you and your team benefited from uh, the insight from Connected Baby? How's it how's it changed your one your way of thinking and your way of working? So for me, it's personally and professionally on an individual level, what it what it did for me, I mean, I remember, I'm sure Suzanne does, a moment of great frustration, um, having heard and read a bit about what Suzanne was saying and doing and thinking and finding out, if you like, picking up the phone, and it just felt like, okay, here's somebody 
who understands what it is that I'm saying and can reflect it back to me in a much more articulate way <laughs> and can also provide me with a scientific basis for what I've always intuitively known to be true. Yes. So from that point of view, it's been an amazing, aff- affirmative um, relationship, actually, between me, Suzanne, Connected Baby. And then from that, what it allowed me to do was watch and discover and create something within organisations where Suzanne has come along, got alongside our staff and encouraged them just to release that intuitive stuff that we all know. This is the stuff that really matters. What matters is how we are together as humans, even when we're really even when we're really doing some hard stuff and some hard thinking and some painful, painful work with some of the most vulnerable or in-need people in our society. It's given us confidence. It's given us power. It's given us inspiration. Um, So, you know, I I could go on and on and on. I think it's transformative. and, And mainly what it's done is give us courage, really, to say, actually, this is... This is what matters. We need to... I mean, the the biggest thing for me is the stuff around pain. I always see when I invite groups of staff to come along and, and meet Suzanne or work with Suzanne on a day, you will cry, you will laugh, you will do some really deep thinking and you will walk out within a day and you'll, you'll feel transformed not only as a practitioner or a professional, but also as a person. Because the beauty of it is its simplicity. And, in and it fact, is that message, which is bring your whole self to your job. You know, we don't have, we don't have the kind of false boundaries that we we think we we might we might. It's messy being human, and it's messy being involved in the work that we are. And in fact, what I love is that when I've worked with training that Mary's put together, she explicitly doesn't call it training. She also always calls it having a courageous conversation. And so, just the title that she gives to those events reflects that relational way of thinking. Mary, one final question, because uh, the, the, I was about to sort of wrap up the interview because you ended beautifully there, I have to say. But just what do you think is the biggest challenge that faces Connected Baby and Children First in getting more and more people to adopt connection and attachment? Oh, it's a big question, isn't it? I think, though, if you can unlock... If you can unlock that bit of us, all of us, wherever we are, that thinks there are simple solutions to complex problems, um, then we can we could make some real change. So I I think it's for connected baby, it's it's being heard in the right place at the right time by the right people. It's seeing things as Suzanne does in a way which um, helps people just to unlock and shift their thinking. It is a bit of a mind shift. It's a bit of a reframe, I think, for the country. Um, and once you do that, I think it's it, be, it all becomes, you know, it's, it's it's quite simple. It's not easy. It's hard. It's going to be challenging. But it's quite simple, really, once you make that mind shift, once you unlock that potential where you truly believe this thing around, that's right. It's about what it means to be human. It's about facing up to pain. It's about facing up to our own individual pain and professionally we all carry our stories with us and our experiences too and they come into that working relationship that we develop with other people and until we really connect with that um, I think it, it can be a bit of a barrier to really unlocking the potential that there is in the country. I think Connected Baby have done more than any other organisation than I, that I know to get us started on that journey. It's certainly I've watched it happen with other people and I'm sure that they'll um, continue to make some real inroads there. And for us, the challenge is, so what can we do to help? What is it that we can do in the midst of all our complex partnerships? So we work alongside government and we want to support them. We work alongside local authorities and other partners and we want to support them. But we also want to find a way to supportively challenge them as well so that they hear some of this really important stuff. And so we, as well as deliver services as really good and effective partners, we also want to be quite courageous in the way that we might just help shift thinking so that people understand it is a little bit more complicated than we might have previously thought. 
Mary Glasgow from Children First. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. This was a GRC production for Connected Baby.